Okay, so <coughs> here we are, uh, finishing up our, our series of tutorials on the Lake Bourne Ledger image. Uh, we're just going through now some sped up footage showing the rendering of the Lotus. Now the Lotus uh, is a little bit uh, different to what I've done in the past. It's uh, what generally what's referred to as a variegated Lotus and this is uh, very commonly seen in renderings of Guru Rinpoche uh, Padmasambhava and so uh, here in the sadhana that I'm using to uh, this, uh, or I'm painting as the, the image from the description says uh, that, that the lotus is uh, in this style so I've added this um, uh, variegated lotus and what I'm doing here is just beginning the, the process of rendering it into 3D. Um, this is no different to any of the other processes that, um, that I've shown in the past. It's simply um, working with two layers set to soft light blend mode and what that does is it creates uh, either a lightening or a darkening uh, of the tonal values of the layers that are below it. So if you paint black uh, in a soft light blend mode, everything that is below that in the layer stack becomes darker. But it keeps its own colour, so it's not like putting transparent black that would make it very uh, muddy and uh, very uh, unattractive to the eye. It's, it's, what it's saying is that the black will darken the existing colour, um, keeping its, uh, its hue value, if that makes sense. Uh, you can experiment for yourself and see the, the difference. You can create a layer and paint over the top with uh, a transparent black. To darken your color or you can set it to soft light blend mode and do the same thing and just look at the way it affects the color values. Uh, similarly we have uh, another layer that is used in this process which is uh, creating highlight values so it's lightening the tone of what's below it and uh, that's done by painting in white. If you paint in mid-gray uh, it will do nothing. So anything lighter than mid-gray will lighten, anything darker than mid-gray will darken what's below. In the layers palette you can see there I've got um, a number of layers that are, are red in colour. And that's just so I can uh, easily identify the, the layers which will be uh, set to that soft light blend mode and which will cause the shading to occur. And those layers will all be flattened down to one layer, but by having multiple layers uh, it can save you a, a little bit of, or quite a lot of work actually with the eraser tool. The brush I'm using here is set to 30% opacity. It has um, a soft edge and it uh, has a spacing set to around uh, 25%. That spacing uh, is fairly important because it defines the fall off of the gradient or the, the overall softness of the brush. If you have the spacing set to 0%, um, which would be giving you the technically the most accurate brush. Uh, the the fall off uh, is too too abrupt. But again, you can experiment with that and see um, see what qualities that you like in your own um, for your own style. Now the reason I use a 30% brush uh, and painting in black here to shade is because 30% gives you three attempts or uh, three um, 
yeah, three strokes with the brush, which will enable the brush, in this case, will reach up to 90%. So if you do one brush stroke, that'll give you a 30% cover. If you cover that again, it'll be 60. Then the last one will be 90. Um, that's important because it enables you to uh, have a visual effect where the uh, shadows would accumulate. So where there's, uh, a, for example, uh, a shadow which is um, occurring because something is in front or behind of it, um, that would cause one darkening effect. Uh, and then the second would be uh, the definition of the actual shape itself also causes a darkening effect. So the, the object can be obscured by one object, which darkens it, uh, or it can just be uh, curving away from the, uh, the, the plane of view uh, or the plane of lighting, I guess you could say. And that would also cause a darkening effect. So uh, if you have the uh, three levels, of shading, then you'll be able to get uh, some very realistic shading because you'll be able to shade to uh, to multiple effects. If you had it at 100%, uh, you wouldn't have that opportunity and your shading would look quite flat. The opacity that you choose is also going to be dependent on the darkness of the color that's below it. If you have a very light color and you shade on top of that, let's say that pink, 30% um, will be quite, um, won't produce a very strong shading effect. However, if the color is very dark, like the blue and the green in, in uh, the screen here, then the shading effect seems to be more. And that's just a product of the way the, uh, you know, the engineers that Adobe created the soft light blend mode. <laughs> but for us as artists, we don't need to care about that. All we need uh, to know is that uh, perhaps when you're shading something dark, you should bring the opacity down to 20%. And when you're shading something that's very light, uh, it should come up to perhaps 50%. And if you're shading something that's very, very light, such as, uh, let's say, the, the moon cushion that you can see there, then you need to actually abandon the soft light blend mode altogether and you, you need to paint with a colour um, because the soft light blend mode will have almost no effect on a, uh, on a, something that's tonally almost white. In this picture that um, I'm working on, the Lake Bourne Vajra, both of the deities uh, in the, the central figures, uh, they have they describe the sadhana as having skin which is essentially white. Um, so um, I had to adopt uh, a shading method or mechanism which is different to what I would usually do uh, and that was to actually paint with a colour to do the shading um, and that's actually how it would be done traditionally you know you choose uh, a shading tone and a, and a highlighting tone typically the shading tone, tonal value uh, chromatically it would be uh, cooler in temperature and the highlights would be warmer in temperature. You can see here uh, that the lotus at this point has an outline uh, in the finished image, I removed the outline altogether in the lotus. So the outline is just here to help me uh, know where to erase to. And this defines it in this rendering stage. But in the final image, what I did was uh, remove the outline altogether. And that makes the lotus very soft. And you can see here the outline is causing it to be uh, a little bit cartoonish and a little bit harsh. But when the outline is removed, then uh, it becomes very, very soft, which is, of course, the quality that a flower petal would have. When you're doing your tankas, you should, um, I think it's very beneficial to think about um, 
the outline and how much of it you want to be present and not just have a atti uh, an attitude where the line is dominant throughout the image to the same level. You should be thinking to yourself, uh, should the line be strong in this area? Should it be weak in this area? Should it not be there at all, for example? As in some clouds and often when flowers are rendered. So there we can see I've, we've removed the outline and we're starting to get an idea of what the, the final shading of that lotus will look like. Another, while we're talking about the uh, outline properties, you, uh, another thing that you can do wrong is, is if you remove the outline altogether, then you end up uh, stepping outside of the stylistic uh, boundaries or limitations that a, a tanker should have, and you'll end up end up producing something which is it doesn't look correct if you're trying to reproduce a Tibetan style tanker. So you also have to be wary of that. Here we can see those yellow layers that have popped up. These are the highlight layers. So these are now bringing the, uh, the color values higher than they are in, the, in their original flat color. The highlights are generally much easier and quicker than the, the shadows. Okay, now we're working on the hand. Uh, and what, what I'm doing here is uh, adding the, uh, the pink coloration that occurs on the, the palms and the soles of the feet. So what I've done is I've really just, um, just brushed it in very roughly on a separate layer just to get the basic shape and now I'm just refining that shape uh, by adding to it with the brush tool and erasing it with the eraser. You can see that this color layer I have is underneath my shading layer, so um, every, this, this stage is very easy since I don't need to reshade this color. I just need to paint it on as a flat color and the shading is already present. You could have defined this uh, in the stage where you did your initial sketch, so there could be an actual outline defining uh, this, this um, change in colour on the hands. Mm, but in this instance I chose not to do that. I wanted it to be... Uh, I didn't want it to be defined by an outline, I wanted it to be soft and um, I think once the rendering is done you have uh, the shading which defines the hand as a, or the feet as a 3D object, it's a little bit easier to uh, know where to draw this uh, the, the boundary of the colour, I guess, which is really defined by the foreshortening of that 3D form. So because there's no outline here to work from, uh, I'm just paying a lot of attention to making sure that that line is smooth and not bumpy. So here again, just flooding that area with uh, color in a very uh, rough way zoomed out and then gradually refining it by zooming in choosing the more accurate brush.
you can see the uh, one detail we can talk about there is the, the detail of the fingernails. Um, just with often there's an additional line uh, at the very root of the, the fingernail which kind of defines that if you look at your own hand that little half moon section um, you can choose to have that line uh, and you, you can paint it as a slightly darker color or you can uh, not choose not to have the line and, and then just have that little uh, gradient of red that comes out from the root of the, the fingernail. That's similar to the uh, how you render the eyeball as well. You have the, the red gradient coming in from e either the, the inside and the outside corner of the, the eyeball. So you can choose that for the, uh, the fingernails as well. <coughs> I think the um, uh, I was saying before about the color of the, the skin so you can see how light the, the skin tone is there. So similar to uh, Avalokiteshvara or uh, Vajrasattva. Here in the, the sadhana, the, the skin is described as being white in color with a little red. Um, so that's kind of, that's a little bit hard to know exactly what that means. And so you really have to talk to someone who does this practice a lot to, to understand what that means in terms of visualization. whether it's just referring to uh, a sheen to the skin or whether um, the darker, the shaded areas of the skin should be red or whether there's uh, almost like a marbling in the red. It's a little bit hard to say and I think um, I've come across this before in, in uh, another sudden in, in uh, often in the Vajugini sadhana, the, the moon cushion is, des is described as being white with a little red. And, uh, you know, as an artist, you might think, oh, that's just pink. But I, it's, it's not quite like that. It's not describing a colour. It's describing uh, a form, I guess you could say. So I, I guess what I'm saying is it's not saying that it's white mixed with red. Uh, It's like white that has a quality of red throughout it. So it's, it's a different thing, I think. So here, when I was rendering, I experimented with a few different things. And really the thing that looked the best is, um, is I, I just chose to render the skin with a red tone in the darker areas. And that was in keeping with, with two other tankers that I had for reference with this image. And then I think if there's, you know, if there's some, uh, if a meditator who's done this practice a lot has some personal advice on how it should be visualized, then that would be a wonderful thing to, to receive. But from the, um, you know, from the context of just uh, painting the tanker here, then, uh, you know, you perhaps don't have to, try and achieve that exactly. Um, since what you visualize is very different to the tanka. The tanka is really just a support for your meditation. Um, visualization, I mean, they use the term visualization uh, and we think, oh, it means to, to, to engage with an object with the visual sense power, but I don't think that's right. Uh, visualize is more like actualize. Uh, you, all the senses are engaged in bringing something that's imagined to life. And so the tanka, you know, can attempt to achieve that, but it's, it's really a, a very different thing when it comes to the, the subtlety of the mind and the the vision that occurs within the meditator's mind is much, much more three-dimensional and, and alive. And it should be. It's not just a visual thing. All the senses are engaged. 
uh, one of the senses that, that my Lama would often talk about was uh, that the uh, you know we don't really have a sense power that describes this but there should be a feeling of presence and so at, not only are they visually present but on the level of feeling uh, of experience they're present so there's all these very subtle aspects to, to visualization and I, one of the wonderful things about being an artist and a uh, tanker painter is that you can try and uh, achieve that beauty, that subtlety of mind through your art. And that then becomes a gift to other people. You never get it, you know, you can't get it quite right. But the beautiful, the, the masterpieces have convey something about the deity that uh, is not just paint and pictures and outlines. They're somehow there. Okay, so now just a couple of quick clips of me rendering the, the jewellery. Uh, the jewellery is my least favourite thing. It requires a lot of repetitious uh, painting, as you can see here. When you're doing your tankers, uh, when you get to rendering things like the jewellery, which are really just repetitious shapes, then you need to make sure that uh, the way you render is repetitious uh, so that you can get through it quickly and without it being too laborious. And you just need to work out the, uh, the most efficient order of brush stroke and eraser stroke. Um, and the brush size will also be important. So we're just coming up towards the uh, end of this little tutorial. This is the last thing that I'll do on the uh, Lake Bourne Vajra image. As I said in the previous tutorial, this is a secret, so I can only show you a little parts of the image. And uh, I, unfortunately, I can't show you the whole image. But I hope you've learned something from this process and um, um, that there's some uh, benefit to, to making these videos. I'm sure that uh, one day uh, someone will <laughs> enjoy watching them and uh, I think uh, I want to keep doing it. You know, Not many people uh, look at the pictures and the, uh, the tutorials but um, I think it will become value, valuable as time goes by. So um, again I hope uh, you're enjoying the tutorials and that you're uh, learning how to make beautiful art for both your own practice and for uh, sharing with other people and it gives you a doorway into uh, what's most important to you which is creating a, a beautiful mind and bringing the, the mind of a human being to its uh, ultimate evolution which is uh, of course enlightenment. So take care, happy painting and we will see you in the next tutorial.